Welcome everyone, my name is Mark. I'm here from representing Advanced Assembly and Royal Circuit Solutions. And we're here to help you figure out how to get through this darn component shortage, how to save money on your designs, and how to just generally be a better person, a better engineer, better everything. So it's gonna be fun. I'm joined today by Lydia Ariagi, Ariaga, I'm sorry, and Christy Powell of Advanced Assembly, and I'll introduce them in just a second. But before we get going, down at the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a little box for Q&A, questions and answers. If you have any questions as we go through, please ask them there rather than the chat. It's just easier for me to keep track of everything that's going on. Uh, with that, let me bring in Lydia and Christy. Lydia, how are you? I am good, Mark, how are you? I'm doing well. I always love these webinars. Hey, um, tell us a little bit about you, yourself, maybe your family, and what you do for Advanced Assembly. Sure. So my name is Lydia Ariaga. I'm a sales manager here at Advanced Assembly. I've been fortunate enough to be with this company 15 out of the 17 years it's been around. Um, I live here in Aurora, Colorado. I raise four kids. We love doing all Colorado things out here. It's uh, snowing a lot, but we managed to truck ourselves into the office today. Um, what I do is I help customers in any facet that they need help, which is getting their printed circuit boards built quickly, uh, cost effectively, and um, helping them take their prototypes and new, new products into production. Very cool. Well, thank you for taking the time to, to spend with us today. And uh, Christy, how about you? Uh, yeah, so my name is Christy Powell. You guys can call me CP for short. Uh, I am the director of, of purchasing. So I oversee our quotation, sourcing, and uh, procurement teams with Advanced Assembly. Um, I've been with the company for six years next month. Uh, and I've been in manufacturing and supply chain for about 20 years. That's really cool. Um, you guys both have radically different jobs. Uh, Lydia, you know, you're... <laughs> You're, you know, putting out fires over in sales and, and Christy, you're putting out fires over in parts. Do you two work together often on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, let's say an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Yes. Whoa. <laughs> That's <laughs> pretty crazy. All right. So let me, let me start with something um, simple. I, I design boards is one of the things that I do. I, they're not very good, but nobody needs to know that. We'll, uh, we'll edit that out. Um, but let's say I, I have a, a design and, you know, I, I generate my bomb, you know, all my CAD files, everything. I would send them to Lydia, right? Correct. And then what happens with them there, Lydia? Well, we'll do a quick precursory check on your data to make sure that you gave us everything that we really need. We're also going to kind of tear your bomb apart a little bit. Um, we run some really sophisticated automated systems for part sourcing through an API. And we need to have information in the bomb. We need to have manufacturer's part numbers. We need to have descriptions. We need to know how many different bomb lines you have, how many times you use those parts. And we format the bomb to go through that API. So if you are working with somebody here and they reach out to you about your bomb format, um, make sure that you're putting it in a format that we can read. The reason why we ask for this data is we just wanna turn the quotes quickly and accurately. And what format is that? What format that you can it's use? A, it's an Excel format. And we have all the parts uh, that are the same part grouped together, listed with a quantity. So there's a couple of different ways that you can send a bomb. And we like all the family or the parts of the same family to be grouped on one line. And some customers sometimes tend to put one reference designator per line. Um, making the bombs really long and harder to manage. So that would be one thing is, is definitely look at your bomb format. We have best practices. We can even supply um, just a, a sample bomb that you load your parts into, which is great for our system. Okay, so I send you all that stuff and then part sourcing is absolutely killer these days. Um, you know, I, I've got sitting over there, you know, I'm starting to stockpile my own parts on hand so that I can send them out to you guys when I need stuff built. Um, it, it's just getting nuts. How do you guys deal with part availability? Do you even deal with part availability? <laughs> so um, I'll explain the magic that happens behind a quote. And then of course, Christy can really dial into um, the software and how it works. 
When you send us that data, we turn quotes in about 24 hours. So the minute we get your data, we start formatting the bomb to go through the API and sourcing all the components. And you're right, Mark, parts are a mess right now. At that same time, we have our process engineers reviewing the assembly, uh, verifying the pricing, what the lead times should be if there's any special requirements. And the board house is also quoting the PCB. We turn quotes again in 24 hours. So we have to wait for all three of those pieces to come back so that we can format a quote to our customer. Um, right now with parts being the way that they are, uh, we usually send what we call an exception report back with a quote and that are parts that can't be sourced, um, parts that have lead time or parts that are just unavailable. And from there, we work with our customers one-on-one -on -one to see what we wanna do next. And that's where the flexibility piece comes in. Do our customers wanna consign us components? Do they have a few spares there? We're pulling parts off of old revisions. We have second tier distribution that we can reach out to um, in order to find all the components and get the boards built fairly quickly. All right, but you said that's, this is something more that you manage and oversee though, but Christy's the one doing the work. That is correct. That is all correct. right, let's hear from her. So Christy, I mean, okay, so I send Lydia all my files and I make it Lydia's problem. And then Lydia makes it Christy's problem. What does that look like? Uh, well, I definitely think it's a collaboration uh, in, in advanced assembly from, from everybody, um, from sales and, and from my teams in particular. Um, so I wanna give credit there. Um, but when we do start the quote, we're going to drop it into our software. Again, as, as Lydia mentioned, um, formatting is important so that um, it, it doesn't delay or, or have problems in the software. Um, and from there, we're going to basically ping APIs direct through our distributors. Um, and, and we're going to have live information that comes back. Um, as she, she notated, we are seeing a lot of lead times. Um, you know, this is just something that's very prevalent in this industry right now. Um, so we're going to give that information to the sales rep, um, ultimately to the customer about lead times um, and some options there as to whether or not they're going to supply those parts, um, if they're okay with those lead times, or whether or not they want us to go out to those second tier distributors. Uh, one thing I do want to mention for second tier um, is it is it's still difficult. There is an increase in cost for second tier distributors. You're going to have longer lead times. Uh, so something to keep in mind when you're creating those bombs is be able to provide multiple alternates for diodes, for connectors, um, in order to minimize having um, inventory that's available. It's just moving very quickly. What is, a, forgive me for asking, but what is a second tier distributor? I mean, sure. I've been called a third rate engineer, um, but I, I don't know about second rate or second tier distributors. So our second tier distributors are basically independent distributors. Uh, we work with authorized distributors. Um, we definitely want to make sure that they've got a connection to the manufacturer. And that's where we're going to go first. Um, other than that, we're going to look at, at companies such as Windsource, um, as an example. Uh, they are in China, um, but they have a quality program. So we really vet these things out too. We don't just buy from anybody. We want to make sure that they have quality standards, that they're, they're not at risk for counterfeit parts, because um, certainly we, we don't want to be Put in that situation um, on our end and obviously for an engineer either. Um, so we'll, we'll give that option um, for the, the second tier distributors that we have authorized um, and whether or not we want that as an option to go with. All right. Um, is there anything that engineers can do to make your job easier? Yes, um, alternates. Um, <laughs> I can't state that enough. For passives, if you allow for us to do alternates, uh, caps and resistors, we certainly will look and try to find something if there is a, a problem with stock. Uh, we'll, we'll try to actually answer that on our own if, if that's okay on your end. Um, and then the second part is, is we're not gonna substitute you know, connectors or diodes. So if you have multiple parts in your bomb, um, that just helps. Again, stock is moving quickly so we can quote something and in 30 minutes that stock actually could change uh, so if you have those alternates, we can always reference that to not delay that as you as you place your orders. So uh, I've got two questions about that, one for you and then one for Lydia. One is, how do you want us to um, indicate an alternate? Do you want us, like for a capacitor, do, do you want me to say CERT cap, uh, 10 volt, uh, X7R, you know, 0.1 UF? Or do you want me to say, a you know, multiple specific MPNs? 
Multiple specific MPNs, especially when you're looking at, um, you know, connectors and diodes, certainly we want to have those, those MPNs. Uh, for, for passives, it really is just communicating with the sales rep that, that you're okay with getting alternates for your passives so that we know. Um, we have a, a, a portion called parts trace. Um, what that is, is there are some, some bones where it's very, very specific. We, they need to know that certain parts are placed on the boards. Um, and so there's that call out, and that means that we are not going to substitute anything on your bomb. Um, so if you're just open and kind of communicate that with the, the sales rep so that we know what we can substitute and not. And Lydia might be able to, to ping in a little bit on that. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark, when it comes to passives, like Christy had mentioned, the way that the API works and the way that different software tools work we really want to see a manufacturer part number for every single bomb line. We would prefer that you give us, um, if there's 10 approved alternates, all 10 part numbers. That API cannot search by value. And what, it, what happens is a human has to get involved when we receive a bill of material that only lists passives by description or value. Um, because if a, a comma is in a different place or a period, or they call out their wattage or percentage different, we can never find a match. But when we have a manufacturer's part number in the API, it shoots out the value, giving us many options from many suppliers to choose from. And if our customers are okay with substitutes, let us substitute everything we can up front. We're always going to be 100% transparent. We want you to look at those substitutes and approve them before we begin the build. Um, now, Christy mentioned something that, you know, parts can disappear in a half an hour. I, I experienced okay. that on my last design to the extent was as I was adding things to my um, uh, to my design, to my schematic. I was adding parts to my DigiKey basket and I was checking that out like every hour just to avoid it. <laughs> you know, just give me those things. Um, but that was on something where, you know, the parts weren't necessarily flowing through you. Uh, if parts th flow through you and things are moving that fast, how do I lock in those parts? How do I get you to buy those when I want you to buy them? So that's, um, that is something that we struggle with because all companies are a little different on how they can execute a purchase order or execute a buy and how fast that goes. Uh, the moment that we have a quote um, finalized, meaning all exceptions have been cleared and sourced, we ask our customers to place the order immediately and we begin buying the same day. We begin buying the printed circuit boards and all of the components. And don't you guys have a pretty tight relationship with the major distributors? We do. We do. We're ordering every day from them. Um, I believe that our team has baskets going with big distribution of Digi, Mauser, Aero, Avnet every day, all day. That totally makes sense. Uh, and for those of you that are joining us a little bit later in the webinar, we do have a question and answer down in the bottom. If you have any questions about how to get your designs processed in the age of shortages, um, please feel free to ask them. If not, I'm just going to keep asking stupid questions to Christy and Lydia, and they'll pretend that they're good, smart questions. They're not. Just, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> okay, so you, you told me earlier, Christy, that you can source hard to find parts from second tier distributors um, offhand. Maybe between the two of you, you could tell me a little bit more about how I would consign parts over to you. Sure. sure. So consigning parts is really easy. Um, again, I would just want to stress the flexibility. Customers come to us, they want a turnkey job. They want us to buy 95% of the bomb, but maybe they have already identified the parts that they know we will not be able to source and they have bought them, they pre-bought them, they've been storing them, they've been holding them, will allow customers to just send a few bomb lines. Uh, if the customer has the entire bomb in their possession and wants to kit a part to us, we can help with the kitting process too. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into putting together a kit uh, successfully for a contract manufacturer to build it. Some of the things that Advanced Assembly does, um, I think are very beneficial. We can create kit labels for, for our customers based on the bill of material. And all that is, is just a little tiny label that has the reference designator, the manufacturer's part number, the quantity we need with overage, and their job number. This allows the customer to 
take their box of parts, label them up. Um, if they are missing labels or they have extra labels, there's an issue with their kit. This helps them identify if they haven't supplied enough parts to count for attrition and that we're gonna run into a problem. When the customer sends us the kit, we do the same exact thing. Uh, we count the parts that they give us. We verify the part numbers uh, that they sent us or actually what's listed on their bill of material. Any deviations, anything that um, doesn't have the right part number, it's short on quantity or it's missing, it goes through our holds system through SAP where we work directly with the customer to clear those shortages. And again, another flexibility piece, we can buy the shortages or they can send them to us, whatever works best for them. Christy, did you wanna add anything to that? Um, I do, I think that Lydia summed it up perfectly. Again, just making sure you know your bombs when you submit them, that they're clean and clear, um, just to avoid delays um, or issues, especially in the kit process in our receiving departments. Okay, so I've got a question. Um, overages. Uh, it always upsets me as an engineer when, you know, if I know I need 100 of something and you guys tell me you need 120. Um, for a passive that costs, you know, 0 0.002 cents, I don't care. But some of those parts are pretty dang expensive. You know, I've had overages, you know, um, where I needed 10 of something and the company asked, I mean, it, it wasn't you guys, by the way. The company yeah. asked for, for 20, and these ICs were like 60 bucks a piece. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? So can you tell me about um, what overages are and maybe how we would deal with a situation, how advanced assembly would deal with a situation like that? Absolutely. So we do need overages. Um, we run pick and place machines here. They work off of feeders loaded into magazines. And when we open the tape and reel, unfortunately, a few parts are going to pop out. But let me differentiate for our customers that are listening and you, Mark, as an engineer, the parts that cause us severe pain are the passive components, usually 0402 and smaller. We have to have that extra feeder and or that extra length on the tape to get them into our feeders. We have some pretty, we have some pretty hard rules about overages and um, I could supply those to anybody who's interested, but we also are very flexible. Again, parts that are over $5, we ask for one to two pieces. And those are usually ICs, connectors, parts that don't get lost in the pick and place machines. We ask for one or two extra pieces in case something happens in manufacturing that we don't delay your job because we got an exact count. Um, all spare parts are returned to our customers after the build. So we're not keeping anything that we don't use. We can send it back to them and they can put it back into their inventory. Parts that are over $25 each. Now those are your BGAs, again, usually bigger ICs, some connectors. We don't, we'd love one piece, but we don't make it mandatory. Okay. And again, that's, that's just part of our assembly process where we use the machines as much as possible. We can cut custom trays that allow us to work with exact counts. It's just those small parts. And I don't want to delay anybody's job over 25 pieces of a 0402 resistor that costs a fraction of a penny. Yeah. And, and that totally makes sense. All right. Um, so if you do, if we do have the higher, the higher cost items, we can make, ex we can make exceptions. We just need to talk to you. We, can. Like we just, we just need to communicate. A good life lesson, Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, another issue that I've noticed recently is that prices are going up everywhere for everything. Um, a gallon of milk, for some reason, at the grocery store the other day was eight flipping dollars. I mean, granted, that was the organic, but I got to think that was like six dollars a, a, a year ago. Um, why are prices going up? Is there, and is there anything I can do about it? And this question is for both of you. I, I think it's a, a few things. Um, you know, I definitely think that, that people are, have labor shortages right now. Um, and I think that's impacting costs. I think materials are, are short. Um, you know, we see that just in, in talking components, the, the last few minutes. Um, again, I think it's, um, 
you know, preparing as soon as you can, submitting your quote as soon as possible, ordering that as soon as possible, try to avoid lead times, again, from independent distributors to reduce that cost. Uh, Lydia, on, on your end. Yeah. yeah. So everything that we're talking about, um, we're starting to feel the pinch just everywhere. So printed circuit board laminates, the raw laminates are starting to creep up. Um, we know that gold is an a high premium, has been for a long time. We forget that all of these raw materials go into electronics and printed circuit boards. And as materials are coming in, first of all, they're taking longer. I, I recommend to my customers that if they are thinking of a exotic material or an exotic stack up to let us review it first, let us verify the materials that we have in stock so that we're not placing special orders for laminate that could take six to eight weeks to get here, um, where you're forced to buy a huge minimum quantity of it, even though you only need a few panels worth and let our engineering staff help you come up with a design that works with the materials we have. Um, I'm, uh, we're all feeling the pinch on gasoline right now. It won't be long until overnight packages from FedEx and UPS start to skyrocket just to cover these costs. So just always looking at your timeline, uh, trying to be in front of it, uh, working while you're waiting for a lead time on one thing, you're, you have another thing in the pipeline so that it doesn't always stack up. And that would be one of the key things right now. Um, we're trying to prevent as much of an increase to our customers, but we can only cover so much. That makes sense. Christy, did you want to add anything to that? Or you are, I know you did at the beginning at the front end of it, but did you want anything else? Um, I, I think that's it. You know, we, we do the best that we can to, to help the, the customers and, and reduce costs. Um, we're just seeing that and anticipate that. The other thing I would say too, is if you have parts, for instance, on a build that you know you're gonna use again, you can certainly communicate that to the sales rep too, so that we can actually buy those additional parts on that run. And it's gonna come in in your kit and you won't have to worry about getting that supply of, of that specific part um, if you have another build that's coming. Okay, that totally makes sense. Um, are there any, I don't wanna say gotchas, but for the lack of a better word, I'm gonna say gotchas, that you see engineers or traps, how about traps? Any traps you see engineers fall into um, that increase the cost of their board? Lydia, you said that if they have, you know, very specific stack ups, or maybe we don't have those laminates on hand, uh, that can definitely increase the cost. Anything else as far as the assembly site or mistakes that engineers make um, that you wish they didn't? Again, we talked about the data formatting. Um, we do a pretty extensive design for review before we actually release a job to the production floor to prevent line down situations, or we should say line lockup situations, meaning our engineers vet our customers' designs. Uh, they are looking for many different things. I would say the, the worst thing that happens to our customers is they call out a part number on their bill of material and they put a different footprint down on their printed circuit board. Um, that's kind of a catastrophic issue, especially if it's an IC. And um, we wouldn't want to be 75% of the board built to identify that on the line. So we actually identify that up front, which allows the customer to look at their design, make the modifications. If something has to be turned over or supplemented, the costs are going to be way low. We haven't wasted a lot of time and materials on building it. Um, and our customer isn't stuck with a fully assembled unit, except for the most important part on the board didn't fit. Totally makes sense. So design for assembly checks. And is that that's something yep. you guys do for all your customers, it sounds like? We do it on every job that is actually placed on order with us. Our customers can take advantage of that if uh, they have a brand new design and maybe they are they just need another boost of confidence. I can do that at the time of quote, if you give me 24 hours to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, even as a third grade engineer, uh, I can tell you how complicated complicated board design is. There's so many things you have There's to so keep many track pieces. of. It's easy yeah. to make mistakes. All right, That's so we have a, a question from Ryan. Ryan, thank you for participating in our webinar today. Uh, Ryan says, 
Can you comment on the supply chain trends you're seeing over the last six months? Are things getting better, staying the same, getting worse? And then I'm going to add to that, do you know anything about what, what we expect to happen in the future? So, so we are watching supply chain very closely. Um, I wish I could uh, give Ryan a smoking gun. What we have noticed is um, it is starting to improve, but all industry trade reports are saying it will last uh, throughout the rest of 2022 and probably into the first quarter of 2023. And that is for silicon-based components. No! Um, <laughs> uh, I know. Um, so, so one thing we are noticing with um, big distribution is when they when they list a lead time that seems just totally unreasonable, that's because they don't have updates from the manufacturers themselves. And although something may say it's got a lead time into 2023, if we continue to check stock um, with those manufacturers, there will be some visibility. And sometimes parts come in and out of stock when you weren't expecting them. I just encourage customers to keep watching. If you see them, buy them immediately. Like you said, Mark, put them in your cart and buy them. Most contract manufacturers will take your consigned parts. Wow. All right. Christy, I'm going to ask that same question, but this time I want a happy answer. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, try I, it. I have to, I have to agree with, with Lydia, what she's seeing. Um, That's she, not a happy answer. I, I realize. Um, <laughs> the one thing that I do want to, to mention is that we have very, we have a lot of communication with um, our distributors in particular. We reach out to them constantly to see exactly what their stock looks like. Um, and to Lydia's point, this is really what they're seeing. There has been improvement um, in this year, but, but there still are those, those struggles that are happening. Uh, for manufacturers, they're just trying to keep up. They're trying to, to get the materials in. And because of that, it's, it's very hard to give a, a trend or a visibility as to, you know, when are they going to be able to release that next batch? Um, and so it really is just always keeping an eye out for certain parts. Um, we do anticipate for it to improve. Um, I, I don't see that we really getting out of this wave until early 2023, to be quite honest, it could be before then. Um, but just, just based on what I've been seeing on trends. So I know you guys have back channel communications, you know, with, um, with the major distributors that engineers don't, are you aware of any trade publications that engineers can monitor to learn things like you can pick up the phone and you can call, you know, you two can talk to the CEO of DigiKey. I can't. Um, where would I learn about this stuff independently? So I, I would have to reach out to our marketing department um, because I know that we share in some of our newsletters different industry trends from the manufacturers. Um, I believe that they probably, you know, pay for updates and listings on global supply chains. So there is information out there. Uh, we get it trickled down to us. Um, and then again, just with big distribution, we're, we're talking to them all the time. The second tier distribution um, may surprise you on, on what they can turn up. And again, we're not using just anybody that we find on eBay. We are using companies that we've vetted out, that we have placed orders with, that have given us good components um, because we're very concerned about bad components, used components, or counterfeit components. And the second tier distribution can help in a pinch. Um, they, they do cost a little bit more. Sometimes they take some time to get, uh, but there are options out there, even if you're seeing, um, you know, a 56 week lead time on something on DigiKey or Mouser's website, let us look a little harder for you. So you can get stuff that I can, it sounds like. In some cases, yes. Cool. That's great to know. Um, and if, again, uh, for our participants, um, and I say that plural, any, any participant can join if you have any questions. Please ask them down in the Q&A. If not, we'll try to uh, finish up with a few more questions and let these ladies get back to work. Um, so 
what are your biggest pain points on a day-to-day basis? What you, you told me a lot with customers already. Uh, they, they have issues with bad bomb listings, you know, not using the right format, and whatever. What other things do you do you just sit there and you're like, why do they keep doing this? And you know, you just want to reach through the computer and shake somebody by the neck. Other than bomb, because we've covered that. Well, we try not to get too frustrated with customers because we are in the customer service business. That's um, probably why I'm not in sales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, again, just the bomb formatting. Um, I would love to have a conversation with every customer about how to uh, how to format the bombs that we like to see it and also a way that would work well in their system. Um, we, has, we have of late because customers are starting to consign more components because of the shortages. We're a small company. We have so many people in our incoming receiving areas. The kitting is really important to us, Mark. Um, if a kit comes in and it's not, it's not the best shape, it, it could take our team half a day just to get it into a format that we could sort it. Um, so I, again, I'd love to talk to customers about how to label components, um, how, the best way to send them, the formats to send them, you know, making sure we have overages. So kidding is really important. And then just um, another thing, because our software is so dialed in, is when a lot of changes start coming from the customer. Um, when we do a quote, for, for example, we can get you out a quote and then maybe there's a revision that the customer wants to see. Um, and, and just to keep the revisions down as much as possible. Maybe uh, if you decide you wanna make changes, make sure all the changes are made before you submit new data. Lydia, we, there you are. We lost your camera yeah. here for a second. I'm um, sorry. I am going to actually, while we let Christy again tell us about pain points with customers, I'm going to actually go offline for a second and grab a kit of parts. And maybe you and I can have a quick conversation about that, if that's okay. Sure. All right. So Christy, pain points. What do you wish customers knew? What's in your brain that needs to be in theirs? You know, I, I don't have a whole lot because we don't really um, have that, that connection as far as that. Certainly bombs are important. I would say that if you, you do have a bomb where you have multiple parts that you're supplying, um, a suggestion would be to reach out to our sales team and inquire as to how to, to supply that information um, so that it's clear and we can process this um, as quickly as possible. Um, the, the other suggestion is just to make sure that you supply your files your file. um, and try to have as, as complete as information as possible when you're submitting that uh, to us to process. Lydia, did you have anything else in addition? Um, no, again, no. we we're here to help customers. Um, we'll encourage them to, to follow our best practices. Um, their jobs will go smoother. We'll be able to build them faster. In the long run, it saves them money if um, technicians don't always have to get involved to update or correct anything. But again, it's the communication piece. Um, if there's something that we want you to change, we're probably going to reach out and see if we can come to a compromise there. But ultimately, we're a service industry and we're building your products. So you, our customers get to, to make the rules. All right, sorry, I had to disappear there. And I, I hope you heard Chester there filling in for me, asking some questions. I got kits of parts and I got bags. I mean, we're ready to go, Lydia. Um, okay. So what's the first thing I need? So the first thing that you probably need is hopefully your bomb and a set of our kit labels. I there you go. Right here, That's Lydia. Great, <laughs> Yeah, I wonder who gave those to you. I think um, you did, Lydia. I think it was you. <laughs> yeah. So we would want for you to essentially perform an audit on the bag of parts that you have. You should have a label for each bag of components. For us, it's very important that we have the reference designator, the manufacturer's part number, and the value of the component. Okay, so Thank I've you. got it here. Um, so my reference designator is, is I, I'm looking in the camera and it's really small. Is that, am I pointing to the right spot? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
And then my manufacturer part number. Correct. You guys asked for 10 components and I gave you 11. That is correct. So I see something missing from your bomb, Mark. Uh-oh, what's um, that? Yep. So that, that kit label is directly exported from your bomb and it is missing the value of that component. It just says it's a TBS diode. No, it's not. Yes, you're right. It is. You're right. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, so we would only be able to verify that part based on the part number. We would not be able to verify it by the value. I'm sorry, Lydia. That's no good. So let me see. This is a different one. Is this one better? Um, so there is a value on there. Um, it is a, a little light on information, but I think it says a, a 1K 5%. So you would like to see that also say like 0603? Correct. Uh-oh. The wattage, yes. I'm sorry, Lydia. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Should we, try, should we try another? Let's see, what else do we have here? I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Yeah, that one's not good. That one's... So Lydia, I need some new labels. Uh... <laughs> yeah, get me a new bomb, I'll get you some new labels. Okay, but and what, again... if, what if I just give you, would it be better if I just took a, um, I don't know if I have one here, but if I just took a manufacturer's bag and just sent you that, wouldn't that be better then? As long as you write the reference designator on there, you could definitely do that. Okay, so I should, maybe if I put the, the manufacturer on one side and then I put like your label on the other or something? That would be perfect. That, that would, would be, be better. Yep. So Lydia, it sounds like I'm part of the problem. Well, I wouldn't say that. Um, and, and what it is, is, I mean, Mark, we can still proceed with the build it's just that we're not able to do the full verification of the component that we want to do. It has been, it's been known before that, that our customers um, put a part inside of a bag and put a label on it, but it's indeed not that part. Um, even our big distributors, you know, have picking errors. And a part of our process is to make sure that we're placing the right components on the board in the right location. We don't want our customers to receive their product with wrong parts installed. They could spend days and weeks trying to figure out what's wrong. It'll end up coming back on an RMA, causing a huge delay for our customers. And so that's why, that's why we do all of these checks and balances. And I hope that we're not being too strict in the industry, uh, but we have found that, that we catch a lot of things before it's a big deal. What about reels? Uh, anything special okay. about those? I don't know. Not really. I don't know if that's showing up on camera. I can pull it out here. Um, so would I label the bag or would I label the reel? So we would we would want you to go ahead and um, label the bag. Okay. 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 Um, I will share this since this is about um, rising costs and saving money. At least for us, if a customer is buying a component and I know that DigiKey and Mauser will put it on a mini reel for them for an additional cost. We don't need that. We don't require that. It is not mandatory if the customer just gets them in a continuous strip. Yes, perfect. You guys can deal with that? Yes, we can. Oh, wow. Okay, that's great to know. What else should I know about this type of stuff? This is very interesting. I can let you know that if you send me all of those parts and you're only building 10 or 11 pieces, I'm going to send you 97% of those parts back in their original labeling so that you can check them back into your inventory and hopefully consign them again on a new build down the road. Okay. What about, um, do you have any thoughts on Ziploc versus ESD? Well, if your part is ESD sensitive, we would want you to continue to use an ESD bag. We don't want you to use any staples. No staples? No staples. Is that just because it takes a while to pull them out or? Well, it, a person here does have to open and rip out every staple, um, which can be messy. It also damages the bags. Um, and we really just don't want metal, sharp metal around your parts. 
Is that person Sebastian? Because if so, I will staple the heck out of these bags. I'll, I'll just let you know that is a that's a company wide feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? I mean, this is all fascinating information, Lydia. What else should I know about hitting? Um, just that your parts should always be labeled. You should always be referencing to your job number, your reference designator, and communicate with us your tracking information. Believe it or not, we are waiting for your parts to come in. We do manufacture in several locations. We will tell you where to ship your parts. Please don't jump the gun and, and think that the build's happening at the, the last place it happened at could change. Um, every time we receive materials at the wrong location, it's very expensive to pay FedEx to deliver them to the right location. So those are just some of the, the things about kitting. Um, using our kit labels whenever you can is important. Okay. What about um, things that are a little harder to, you know, uh, some things you, you don't get in reels or trays or tubes um, or strips or anything, you know, like for example, this uh, little four wire JST connector. If I have mm -hmm. to send you say a hundred of these, um, I mean, that's gotta be a, a, a nightmare. How would you want me to package those for you guys? So you could probably place those into a bag and then we would ask you to, to wrap that bag in bubble wrap so that nothing is actually damaged. Making sure that you're, if you're reusing an open bag, tape it closed so that parts don't fall out of it. Um, if, you, if you have parts that are easily damaged, use foam and pack them and tape them on all sides so that the parts don't wiggle out during shipping. Not everybody in, in you know, these handling centers and, and distribution centers know what's inside the box and treat them with care. So using tape, using foam, trying not to make your boxes too heavy so that damage happens. Another question, and I will pull up an example here. Um, one of my parts is moisture sensitive. Um, I'm looking for it. It's got a special bag. I don't see the area. All right, so one of my parts is moisture sensitive. Um, the WS2812, which are these little RGB LEDs. Um, okay. You're supposed to place them within, I don't know exactly, like six hours after opening or, or something okay. like that, something really fast. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've had this bag now for months. It's They're going to need to be rebaked. How do I yes. deal with that? Okay. Well, I would definitely reach out to your salesperson and uh, who you're communicating with because we actually need to know that up front. Um, Pre-baking is very common, by the way, and uh, something that we do a lot of. If we buy the parts directly from Digi and they come sealed and there's uh, a sensor in the bag that shows no humidity, well, we know that those parts are, are good to go. When our customers are consigning us parts, if the parts are used, open, um, have been shipped, we're probably going to suspect them to needing a pre-bake, but you do need to tell us up front. Um, because as soon as we get those parts, um, we're going to kind of quarantine them and so that they can go through a pre-bake right before the assembly process takes place. We're probably only going to pre-bake what we need for the bill. So the rest of the parts that you would get back from us in that big reel, you would need to do the process the next time you can sign them. Okay. Um, so one last offer for questions from the participants, if you have any um, from these ladies, I'm about to wrap up, so ask them now. Um, but let me give Christy a chance to share any final thoughts, and then Lydia will come back to you, and then we'll say goodbye. So Christy, any final thoughts, anything I didn't cover, or questions you wish I would have asked? Uh, I don't have anything. I, at the end of the day, we're here for you. So if, if there are questions, reach out, ask, ask them. Um, we're happy to, to help. Um, your success and your build um, very much is, is how you submit the information to us uh, and how we retain those parts, components, um, fab assembly. So 
Well, it's certainly been a pleasure and I thank you for all of your time and expertise. And on a personal note, it's nice to see you again. It's been a couple of years. Thank you. Yeah, yeah as well. Uh, Lydia, any final thoughts on your end? Um, and I really think that we covered a lot. Um, I just encourage customers to always ask if they are second guessing something or if they need to understand why we're asking for the data in the format that we're asking it for. It could be a simple conversation. I, I think that once we explain to customers why we ask for information the way we ask for it, it starts to make a lot more sense and just a few tweaks, we can do business very easily together. Um, our goal is really just to flow back information to our customers about their builds. And if that means long lead times on parts, uh, delays, um, a customer can ask me anytime what's driving the cost of my part and we'll dissect it right there. I can tell them how much the, the fab cost is, how much the parts cost is. If there's one part skewing us, um, have our customers relook at that. If there's something causing the labor to go up, we can review that as well. Um, we're, we're on a roller coaster right now. So we just encourage uh, communication with our customers. Well, Lydia, it certainly sounds like you are the person to talk to over there in sales. I, and there's got to be colleagues just like you with, Absolutely. with with a great deal of expertise. So um, I will reach out in the future, I promise. And I'll, <laughs> I'll try to make fewer fewer mistakes on my bags. Um, sorry about that. What are you going to do? <laughs> hey, um, we're going to... Well, we did record this, this webinar. We're going to make this available at AAPCB forward slash blog on the Advanced Assembly YouTube channel. If you are not already, please go ahead and like, subscribe, and share our channel. We've got all sorts of fun information. Uh, we'll, we've got some experiments in uh, playlists going. So if you, you, you might see something that you like. It, it goes from the ridiculous and absurd to the fun and interesting. And if you want to be notified about the next big thing, you're going to find it there. On this webinar, on this recording, we'll go ahead and include the links out to our um, kitting practices. You said there's like uh, five steps to prepare your kit, something like that. Uh, and I think you mentioned another, uh, another something too. I forget what that one was, but we'll find that and we'll attach it to the webinar as well down in the YouTube comments. So Christy and Lydia, thank you so very much for your time today, ladies. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you again if travel ever opens back up. You know? <laughs> well, we appreciate Absolutely. it too. Thank you, Mark. All right. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you. In, thank uh, you. Oh, we'll, one last thing. We'll see you Thursday. Next Thursday, we're going to have um, a conversation about PCB trace temps and heating with